All right, it looks like uh, we have a good cohort of people who've joined us. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Joel Ramirez. I'm the Director of Medical School Tutoring and Med School Coach. I'm joined here by two of our awesome tutors who you'll meet in just a second. And today, we're going to be talking about tips and tricks to master USMLE Step 2 CK. Certainly a very hot topic, especially in the last year, year and a half, as the, the exams um, for Step 1 is transitioned to pass-fail. A lot of focus on Step 2 CK, lots of pressure. So we're going to kind of to try to set you up for success here and, and kind of share some some wisdom and some some information that's going to hopefully help you score high and help you kind of land that residency of your choice so a little bit before we get started you know my, my name is dr ramirez i'm the director of medical school tutoring i am also a vascular surgery resident and i've been a tutor at med school coach for about five years and been in medical education or in education i should say for about 10 to 15 years some disclosures i am an employee of med school coach and i think important thing to highlight is that every student and every tutor is is unique there's no one perfect prep that'll work for everybody so we should just kind of dispel that right now not one there's not one thing that's going to work for every single student so there's some amount of flexibility that you'll require and some personalization so as you go through and as you kind of listen to this wisdom you want to integrate it into how you learn and kind of how you've learned to study and hopefully it takes some some tips and tricks here to move forward so we are joined by two of our amazing tutors. We have Zach and Verda. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves here. We'll start with Verda. Um, go for it, you, you got the floor. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Verda. Um, I recently uh, graduated from Stony Brook Medical School um, and I'll be starting my intern year um, in internal medicine very soon. Um, and you know, I love working for a med school coach. I've had a really great time um, working with a variety of students. Um, and really helping you guys obtain success in whatever way that you uh, define that. And Zach. Hello everyone, I'm Zach. I graduated from the Medical College of Wisconsin last year um, and I went to the University of Iowa um, for my intern year and then I'll be starting my dermatology residency here in about a week. Um, and you know, just echoing what Verda had said, I, I've been tutoring for a really long time and I think the coach, the med school coach mission is one that speaks to me and I enjoy tutoring and love helping students out. So I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you for both of you joining us. I think between the three of us, we probably have worked with at this point, hundreds of students. So hopefully we can, you know, culminate all of our knowledge and, and send some helpful tips and tricks here. So a little bit about what we're going to be doing today. Here's our agenda. We're going to talk very briefly about how step 2CK differs from step one, how you set up a study schedule, how you select resources, how to utilize question banks and self-assessments, some common pitfalls in preparing for step two, more than some, Zach's got a long list for you, lots of pitfalls, our favorite resources for step two CK, and then at the end we'll have a question and answer. So this is kind of your opportunity to, for us to answer any questions you have from us. They're personalized to your study schedule. Feel free to put them in the Q&A function, not the chat. It's a little hard to keep track, track of the chat, but the Q&A function is going to be the best place to put them. And you can put them in throughout the webinar, and as they come up, we'll keep them in that Q&A function. At the end, we'll have a chance to go through as many of them as we can, and we'll have a chance to answer those questions and get you those answers. So really a great opportunity to um, really pick the brains of Zach and Radha here, both who have been extremely successful on these exams and have a lot of experience teaching. So let's start simple. How does step 2CK differ from step one? Verda, do you wanna tell us how? Yeah, so let's go ahead and talk about some of the differences between these two exams. So as you all know, step one has a basic science focus. There's gonna be an emphasis on understanding and application of basic sciences. So you know, you'll know you be heavy on principles of physiology, pathology, biochem, biostatistics. Now, step two differs in that it kind of assesses the examiner's ability to actually apply medical knowledge. So there's gonna be an emphasis on clinical science um, that's essential to patient care. Um, there's also gonna be a pretty uh, heavy emphasis on health promotion and disease prevention. Um, you're gonna notice a lot of questions like, what's the next best step in management? Or what is the diagnosis for this patient? Kind of getting the gears turning in terms of how you're actually gonna, actually gonna start thinking like a clinician. Um, and in addition to that, you'll see principles of preventive medicine. So uh, we're thinking about how we can screen patients um, for diseases, prevent diseases from actually occurring. And then there's kind of this additional component that um, there's been an emphasis on 
including um, like the provision of actual patient care, um, ethics questions, incorporating different systems of patient care, and mitigating errors and risk. Now, additionally, there's going to be a difference in scoring for the two exams. Step, now, step one now operates on a pass-fail scoring system um, as of January of this year, as I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, but step two has kept its numerical scoring system, and that may kind of contribute to some anxiety because folks may feel like there's a lot more uh, pressure to perform well on, on the exam. And of note, the minimum passing score for step two is going to be a 214 um, as of July 1st, next week, basically. Um, now, finally, I think it's important to note that step one is a slightly shorter exam. So it consists of seven 60 minute sections um, with a total of 45 minutes of break time. Could be an hour if you kind of incorporate the 15 minute of tutorial section um, in the beginning of the exam. While uh, step two, it consists of eight 60 minute sections with a total of 40 minutes, uh, 45 minutes of break time. So it's a total of um, nine hours in total. So eight hours versus nine hours in total, which, you know, by the end of the exam, you can really start to feel that a little bit. The extra hour certainly is painful. It's hard to even say it's a shorter exam when you're talking eight to nine hours is just so long. Right. But I have a question for you, Ra. Is it a fact or a myth? Step two CK is easier than step one. This is something that floats around online often. Sometimes I hear it from students. Is it true or false? So um, I'll, since I'm unmuted, I guess I'll, I'll just go first. Um, so I would say that in comparing the two exams, they were equivalent to me in terms of difficulty. And I would say that it's sort of like multifactorial. While step one may have felt that it was very heavy on the amount of details that I had to memorize, I felt like step two um, was difficult in that you actually have to critically think a lot more and that's difficult in its own way. Um, I also felt like because when I uh, personally took the exam, I felt like um, kind of uh, residency programs were going to look at step two scores a little bit more than step one, since the news had just broken out that step one was going past fail, um, I felt like there was a little bit more pressure um, to, to perform well on the exam. So um, they're, they're both very difficult exams and uh, they're not, nothing to mess with, but for different reasons, in my opinion. Sure, Zach, in your personal experience and the experience of the student, students you've worked with, is step two easier than step one? I think it depends on the angle that you're coming into the exam from. Um, you know, if you're, at a traditional allopathic medical school and done rigorous rotations, I think that the sort of hearsay is that step two is a little bit easier. Um, and, and I think that kind of as Rada alluded to, they both have their pros and cons, but I personally felt like if you learn certain types of testing strategies, step two is more amenable to um, a sharp test taker. Um, oftentimes they'll ask you the best diagnostic test and if you can get an ultrasound before a CT scan, you can usually get the question right. And so I felt like when I wasn't sure, sometimes I could lean on my test taking skills. Whereas for step one, I felt like it was a little bit more, you either knew it or you didn't. And I, and I think that tends to be a harder type of test for me personally, because um, I tend to rely on sort of strategies and a structure as opposed to how much I can memorize. So for, for me personally, I thought step two was a little easier, but I do think if you didn't have rigorous clinical training or you had to do rotations in different areas and it was sort of broken up, it could certainly be harder than step one. Yeah, totally. I think, you know, what, what I've seen across students is I, I think these are both really, really difficult exams. I think the content for step two is more palatable for people, right? They'd rather read about diagnostics of disease instead of reading about enzymatic pathways, right? So I think that the process of studying for step two may be less painful than step one, but certainly don't be fooled. Step two is still a very difficult exam. You don't, I know one of the pitfalls is like, you know, there's that, um, the saying, you know, step one, one month, step two, two weeks, and step three, number two pencil or whatever. I just don't think that that is true for step two. And it's certainly not true anymore, especially with step two being, um, the only graded exam. So when you're thinking about step two, you, you really want to try to change your thought process. Be like, this is a challenging exam, something you can do, but you really want to make sure that you don't follow the pitfall of not preparing well enough for it. Because I, I agree. I think that the, the step two, even step one, I think that that's a, that's a myth. I mean, the content is maybe um, more fun to study, which makes it better and a better process, but I think it's still very hard. The... Um, 
next talk about setting up a study schedule. We're here, we'll hear both from Verda and Zach here. Um, Verda is going to lead us. How do you go about setting up a, a study schedule for step two? What are some core principles that you keep in mind when doing this? This is a very common question we get with from our students. Yeah, so in, in setting up a study schedule, I think uh, the first thing that you need to do is kind of reflect on your step one studying experience. Um, and so the first thing you should think about is how are you successful? Um, what things went right when you were studying for step one? Um, and if you're sort of non-traditional and happen to you know, be taking step two before step one or some sort of situation like that, just think about a previous exam that you've taken and kind of reflect on that experience. So um, if you kind of noticed a profound increase in your score from the beginning to the end when you use the UWorld QBank, stick to that. Um, and if you felt like there was a certain video series that really honed in on your specific learning style, then stick to a video series. Um, don't, you know, use a video series for step one and then decide that you're going to read five textbooks for step two, um, because you don't want to drastically change uh, what has worked for you in the past. Um, and other things to reflect on are what things went wrong. So um, what were some things that you feel that you would do differently or, you know, in a more negative light, what do you sort of regret about the way that you studied for step one? You definitely want to improve on those areas. So um, did you feel like there was a resource that you used or a sort of resource style that you used that didn't work for you? Maybe you used um, some sort of textbook or maybe you used a video series um, for step one and that really wasn't your style. So try to switch it up then for step two. Um, at the same time, do you feel like you ran out of time for self-care? Um, when uh, studying for step one. Um, maybe you'll want to incorporate some extra time in your schedule to make sure that you have time for self-care so that you don't burn out early on in your dedicated period. Um, and then another thing I would say is you, you can plan ahead, but also be okay with small changes in your, in your schedule. So, um, you know, I would go into step two uh, study period with kind of a complete study schedule just so that you can remain organized and have a general structure. Um, and, but, but at the same time, be okay with small changes. Maybe you didn't get to complete five videos in a day and you only completed four. It's okay if you know, there are small fluctuations like that. Um, I would also make sure that I'm planning what questions and videos and readings that I have to complete on a daily basis, have some sort of Excel file um, or Word document that you can refer to. Um, but at the same time, in, in the situation where you're not necessarily able to meet all of your goals, it's really important to build flex days into your schedule. Um, you know, as we all know, we aren't just students, but uh, we are also a, a member of a family. We may have partners um, and life happens during uh, study de uh, our, our dedicated uh, study period. You might get sick or you might have an event that you really want to attend or maybe you just need a day off. So make sure that there's days built into your schedule where you can just not study and you can just attend to other things in life. Um, and so what I typically recommend is an absolute minimum of half a day a week, even though I don't love that, but uh, up to a day a week or even two, if you feel like, you know, uh, you've kind of accomplished a little bit more before uh, stepping into dedicated and really have time to do life related things, but also have a day for catch up. Um, if you feel that that's necessary. Um, and then minimizing resource overload. Um, it's something that I'll uh, discuss a little bit more in, in, in the next slide, in the next section, um, but really make sure that you're not trying to use 10 things at once. Do a few things comprehensively, and that will get you a lot farther than kind of overlo overloading yourself with resources. Certainly, so it sounds like really weighing heavily on your previous experience, like don't reinvent the wheel. I think it's, it's kind of nice the difference between step two and step one is you have a you have a sense of kind of how these things work. So certainly right, really absolutely. Helpful. And let's hear from Zach. Zach's going to give us some some more kind of ideas on how he approaches study schedule creating study schedules. Yeah, great. So um, I think my approach, you know, I, I kind of like to use this vacation analogy where it's like if you're going to plan a vacation, you know, you don't just hop in the car and start driving right away, which I think is the uh, intuitive thing for students to do sometimes is to just start studying. Um, before you go on vacation, you like to plan where you're going to go. You might look at a couple different places. Um, you might 
plan that either you're going to drive or take a plane and, and, and you sort of think about the high level structure before you actually start to do the vacation. And I think it's very similar for step two is that start with the high level and define your goals. I mean, you have ERAF coming up around the corner. Do you have a wedding to go to? Do you have, um, are you interested in a competitive subspecialty? Do you need more time to study? When is your dedicated study period? Does it fall in line with your goals of when you want to take the exam? I mean, you guys would be shocked if to see how many students I've tutored that haven't taken a step back to think of when I need to work on my personal statement, or am I going to be stressed out studying for step two while I'm on an away rotation? And I think if you start with a good foundation, all the rest is downhill. So like, just think about when you're going to take it, when you have time to study, and what really big things will impact your studying. I mean, the most common ones are the ERAF application deadline, away rotations, and dedicated studying. Um, and it's really complex. Some people don't finish their fourth year until late in July. And you might want to get that score now before you apply. So I really encourage people to think about this early um, and literally get down to like, when is my test going to be and how much time do I have? I think if you can do that, you're way ahead of the game. Then the rest is a little bit easier. I always like to think about the resources that I'm going to take and talk to people. Um, you know, or resources I'm going to use. So step one is a good uh, way to do this. If you had success with Sketchy or some other resource, you can use that or UWorld, and we'll get into some of that later, but um, talk to people. I mean, it's okay to talk to someone that got a lower score and ask them like, what did they do? Or someone that got a really high score and ask them what they did. It doesn't mean that you have to do what they did. It just starts to show you that many people do things many different ways and it gets your kind of brain jogging on what things you would like to do. Um, and I always think anytime you do anything, it's good to get multiple perspectives. Um, whether that's gonna be your experience or not, it doesn't matter, but it's good to hear from other people, uh, whether it's a tutor or a friend, um, or even just resources from your school, I think it's a good thing to do. Um, I think the next thing I like to do is, and this may be where I differ a little bit, is just, um, I like to determine if the study period and selected resources are realistic. And I do it sort of on an hourly basis. So, you know, a lot of resources actually are timed out. So like, I think you know, there's probably more videos now, but online meded has roughly 40 to 50 hours of clinical video content. UWorld has so many questions and I actually would figure out roughly how long it would take me to do a 40 question block. How long would it take me to finish 50 hours of online meded? And you can just kind of roughly divide out the number of days in your study period and the literal number of hours that you're gonna study a day, maybe usually six to eight, and see if there's a realistic amount in there. Um, another common problem is students kind of overestimate how much they can do. And um, I think what falls into number three too is thinking about how many days you have. Um, a 40 day study period quickly turns into 30 days when you account for the days off that Verda had mentioned, which I actually really agree with. You should take a day off a week, now you're at, roughly 33 days, and then you take a practice test every maybe two or three weeks, now you're at like 30 days. And if you review that practice test, that's another day. And you're suddenly like, oh boy, I have 25 to 30 days to finish all of UWorld. And it's, it's probably not possible. I mean, I think it's just, you really gotta think about what kind of variables are gonna affect your time. And then you make adjustments. You know, you say, well, I only have 25 days, that might be 60% of UWorld and you gotta make a decision. The bucket doesn't get any bigger or smaller. Either you take something out or you add something in. Um, and, in order, and the bucket doesn't expand. So either you get, buy a bigger bucket by extending your study period, or you take some resources out of the bucket to fit more in, but you can't really add more in without changing one of the inputs. And really the only input you can change is less resources or more time. Um, and so after you've kind of thought about everything, I really encourage people to put this into a Word doc. You can use a Google Sheet. There's some web-based apps out there that help you make a schedule. But having a, a rough cut schedule before you even start studying is really important. I would really emphasize that um, I think it's more valuable to have a draft schedule than have done a week of studying blind, um, for sure. Even if it took you a week to make a draft schedule, it's well worth the time. And then the last thing is just um, iterate as you go. You're gonna start studying. You might be doing too much every day. You might be doing too little. And then once you're comfortable, you can add in the extra little stuff like biostats or vaccination review or screening. That stuff I typically see students don't actually like budget time for, but you can kind of fit it in. Unless, you know, and there's an exception to every rule, unless you're like really, really weak in like biostats or a certain section, you might need more time, but 
in general, I think some of that extra stuff can fall in line once you feel comfortable with like the big picture. Well, you know, one of the, it's super important to have a, to be thoughtful about the study period, especially because the longer you're studying without like a clear plan, like people start to like get very frustrated and burnt out. One of the most common questions that we get is how long should I study for step two to get? It's certainly a loaded question. Um, when, when you think about timeline, what do you think for uh, how long should someone spend studying for step two CK? Yeah, so I think the first thing um, that I would consider when answering this question is, again, <laughs> reflecting on your step one um, experience, do you feel like you had too much time? Too much time is a bad thing, uh, just as much as not enough time is. But on average, I've, I've seen that about six to eight weeks is about how much uh, folks usually need for step two, depending on how comfortable that you feel um, kind of with, um, uh, with the material and how sort of uh, closely um, your, your clinical experiences preceded um, your, your step two date. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, some students have like a lot, like a long gap between when they're taking step two and when they finish their, their clinical clerkships. Um, and others, you know, they finish their last clerkship and then they jump right into step two studying. So um, a, a student like that might not need as much time. They might actually need like, you know, four to six weeks. I've seen two weeks. I mean, that that's sort of very specific to, to the person, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Um, maybe if you, you know, start off with a diagnostic test and you're hitting a 260, maybe someone like that could could uh, jump to, to taking um, step two, two weeks later. But I think in general, um, about four to six weeks are about the sweet spot. Um, I personally took eight weeks and I think um, that was actually identical to how long I took for step one. I tend to be more, more of a thorough person um, and that's just what I need to sort of manage my own anxiety. So if you feel, if you tend to kind of take longer and need more time, like don't, again, don't reinvent the wheel, just give yourself more time. But if you, but if eight weeks would give you too much anxiety of that looming uh, exam date, then don't do that to yourself and take the less time, four to six weeks. This is, it's a very like specific and uh, kind of personalized answer. So um, it's, it's kind of hard to say. Certainly, what do, you, what do you think, Zach? Yeah, I think it's hard to say. I mean, it's, it's really specific to the person. Everyone's coming in at different circumstances. I think it's common that people say like, oh, what's the best study period or how much time? But it really just depends on your background, where you're coming from, what you did prior, if you took time off. Um, but I am a believer in the data. If you take a practice test and you're scoring pretty well, and then you take another one after a couple of weeks or a week or two, and it's still doing pretty well and your studying is going smoothly, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's um, something that I would do based on my numbers. And so me personally, um, it also depends on where you're at in your training. I was a little bit tired by the end of my fourth year. And so studying for more than three weeks felt like exhausting to me. I felt like my productivity declining and so much by week three that I ended up moving my test forward and taking it. And I think that's something you have to make a call on your own. And so I think everybody's different. I, I think the takeaway that I want to make is, you know, it's really common even at the beginning of medical school and through medical school and through residency to compare yourself to others and look at what other people are doing. And I think you just got to focus in on yourself and focus in on the numbers and let it be driven by some objective measure rather than a feeling of that other people are taking longer or shorter time. Totally. I think that, you know, my approach to this question is the same. It's very, very nuanced. And I think it depends on a few things. How has step one gone? How has medical school gone so far? Have you been someone that had to repeat classes or repeat step one? Then, you know, I should study for a little bit longer. And the longer is maybe eight to 12 weeks is kind of what we're thinking. And especially, you know, and this answer, this is going to change as, you know, step one is now pass fail and you're on a step two CK. So then it becomes nuanced in the sense of, what are you trying to do with your career, right? What, what is your goal score? What are you trying to achieve? And starting from there, because if you know that you, you, know, you don't need a top score to match in your program of interest or in you know, your location of interest, then, then you can probably lean toward closer to three to four weeks. But if you know you want to be sent in some ultra competitive specialty, like in this ultra competitive geography, and you know step one is only a pass, you know, because it's all pass fail now, then you're someone who wants to invest more time in this. 
And, um, you know, in addition to how step one in medical school is gone, think about third year, right? Because you have just done your shelf exams and shelf exam, you know, the content is very similar between shelf exams and step two CK. So if you've just been knocking your shelf exams out of the park and you've been studying super hard for your clinical exams, then you may be someone who doesn't need to spend a lot of time studying, but you can use those as kind of a litmus test. And so the range that I think of is like three to four weeks, something the shortest. And eight to 12 weeks being the longest if you're someone who wants a really high score or has had to repeat coursework or, you know, has find, found the U.S. Emily to be particularly challenging. So it's quite nuanced and you want to try to, to, to listen to yourself and, and use your previous data and your current data to kind of direct um, your next steps. Super helpful. So let's move on and talk a little bit of selecting resources. So, you know, we could spend a whole webinar on this. So we're, we're just going to try to touch on the highlights and identify, you know, the high, really the high yield important stuff to get you guys going. But we are going to start here with Rada. What are, um, how do you go about selecting resources? Yeah. So um, the first thing that I typically tell students um, is to really kind of uh, internalize this mantra of like minimizing resource overload. I think um, what we tend to do as students is we look at what our friends are doing and, you know, I heard so-and-so scored really high and they use like 10 resources. So I'm going to do that too. Um, but I think it's really important to kind of put your head down, reflect on what has worked for you in the past and what hasn't and kind of minimize um, the amount of resources that you're, you're working through. Um, it's much more effective to complete a single resource in its entirety um, than kind of trying to put your hands in like five different ones and only completing them each like 25% of the way. Um, now, more specifically, um, the most popular question banks are going to be UWorld and AMBOF for step two. Um, and I've had students ask me if they should try to complete both of these in their entirety. Um, in a, in a dedicated step two studying scenario, that can be kind of a lofty task and a bit overwhelming to try to complete two, two entire question banks, both of which have thousands upon thousands of questions. So, and they're both kind of comprehensive um, resources in and of themselves. So again, just stick, just pick one of them and just complete them in their entirety as much as is possible. Like Zach alluded to earlier, you, kind of might project that it's actually not very possible for you to get through, um, you know, all 3000 or some odd questions that are in your world. And that's fine, um, you know, because these question banks also tend to be repetitive. Um, and, and the second thing I would do is kind of supplement your U world with um, some sort of additional resource. So that can be a video question bank like online med ed. Um, you can kind of selectively choose from Boards and Beyond. Um, a lot of folks like Boards and Beyond, um, or maybe even a review textbook. So there is um, there is first aid for step two. There's um, step up to medicine. Um, if kind of reading and um, highlighting are your best method of learning. Um, and then kind of like the last thing that I want to impart is it's really, really important to stay the course. So make sure that you have confidence in the planning that you did. Um, and don't kind of be swayed by um, what others may say to you about your study schedule or what you may notice that other people are doing um, in their kind of personal studying, because just reflect on the fact that they're uh, working on resources that are personal to them and you and two people might have two very different learning styles. Um, so I have students who will, they'll be kind of in the middle of um, their dedicated studying period and they'll say, well, my friend is using this um, question bank and uh, like, you know, she seems to be doing better than me. So maybe I'll just change, I'll switch over to this other question bank um, in the middle of my dedicated studying period when that student was actually making consistent progress. Um, and we have this idea of like FOMO, like if someone else is um, doing AMBOSS um, and I'm doing UWorld, I suddenly AMBOSS seems so attractive to me. So kind of stick to one thing and, and just and just write it out for the entire um, um, dedicated period. And I think you'll be really successful that way. That's super important. There is like the best way to set yourself up for failure is to choose too many resources or start like resource hopping and then you don't finish anything and you, you certainly, it's very easy to get frustrated. So certainly super helpful advice. All right, Zach, what do you think? Yeah, and before I jump into this, I, 
I just wanted to add on to what uh, Verda was saying in the sense that, you know, when's the last time you asked someone how their studying is going and they said, awful, I'm failing, you know, like no one's going to really say that it's going poorly or I'm on th attempt number three. Um, usually it's like, yeah, things are good. I really like the QBank. And I think you got to take it with a grain of salt. I mean, I think it's very rare to find a, you know, relationship where you're just completely honest about how things are going. And so just focus on how your scores are. And like I alluded to earlier, objective data is the best thing that you can utilize. Um, but yeah, let's let's go into the resources. So I, my approach is more um, certainly minimize resources. This is a really common mistake. Uh, you'll never get through anything if you're doing too much. So I think of it sort of as four big categories is like the general content, like what's gonna do all your heavy lifting. And then some of the other categories that tend to be more low key, but important in terms of scoring really well. And so I think for general resources, uh, I would prefer a QBank, um, UWorld is my preference. Um, and I choose it just based on, I think UWorld and AMBOSS are both great resources, but choose it just based on what you think is better for you and what you learn from. I think we all have our biases, but um, I personally liked UWorld. And then I like to do the, I always tell students it's like QBank plus one is like my rule. So you can use your QBank and then pick one other thing. If you want to supplement with video, that's fine. If you want to supplement with text, that's fine. If you want to supplement with Anki, that's fine. But I get a little bit hesitant when students are like, I want to do a QBank plus some video, plus I want to read all the stuff up to medicine and then do some Anki. I think for step two, oftentimes you're a little bit more time crunched. Um, if you have the luxury of doing eight to 12 weeks, sometimes I entertain maybe a little bit of something here and there, but generally I think the QBank plus one is a really good rule. And then um, for other little things like screening and risk factors, there's some podcasts, like what's the most common cause of pancreatitis or you know, risk factors for coronary artery disease or stroke. And then for biostats, there's some great YouTube videos and UWorld modules. And these all take like a couple hours. These are not resources that will be persistent through your entire study period. And so I tend to consider them as smaller resources. And then I think of practice tests in the resource category as well. And, um, you know, this could be a whole nother lecture on its own, but I think the most common ones that I've seen and that I prefer are the UWorld assessments and then the free 120, which sometimes students don't actually know about the free test on the USMLE MDME website, uh, where you can take questions that were actually recycled from old exams. And then of course, there's the NBME exams on the website as well, which are all very useful practice tests. I think um, like the YouTube, you know, for all, all my, my fellow visual learners out there, I, I'm, I'm certainly a visual learner, you know, seeing things on YouTube, exam maneuvers and diagram to me is, is super helpful. It's like an under, underutilized resource. And mm -hmm. um, especially for step two, which does a lot of clinical imaging, you know, chest x-rays, CTs, YouTube is helpful. And then uh, Radiopedia too for you know visual learning super helpful. Um, so now we are going to talk a little bit about question banks and self assessments. I, I think that this is this is something not you know people know that they need to do question banks, but I think it's how you use them is is, is very important. And there are certainly better ways and, and worse ways to use them here. So Zach is going to share us some you know, some of his knowledge and kind of wisdom on how to get the most out of these question banks and self-assessments. It can be so overwhelming. How do you how do you optimize these so you're getting the most out of them? Yeah, so we've talked a little bit about UWorld and AMBOSS, probably the two most common uh, for step 2CK. So I think when you're talking about utilizing question banks, when you, I always ask myself first, students ask me all the time, which one's better, which one's better, which one's better. Um, I think UWorld, in my opinion, is probably the better resource. And I'll tell you why I feel that way. However, there's no right or wrong approach. I've seen students do phenomenal using Amboss. Um, and I like UWorld because uh, the, the, the format is very similar to the real test. It looks exactly like the real exam. And um, I like that the UWorld questions have a learning objective at the very bottom. So in a quick snap, you can know exactly what this question wanted you to know. And then you can read the explanation and all the answer choices. I think AMBOSS is an excellent uh, resource, in my opinion, to sort of augment UWorld and do more questions if needed. But I do find the explanations to be not as thorough as UWorld's explanations. And I do, I have had some situations where AMBOSS is a little bit more, I think, 
kind of nuanced and the exam questions are not always similar to the MBME format. And so I've had students that run into a little bit of overthinking and kind of um, going down, I think, a, a, a sort of more challenging path doing AMBOF questions. However, they're both a phenomenal resources. Some of the pros of AMBOF over UWorld are actually that AMBOF has a really large, robust um, learning reef, like library. So you can Google things, you can look at it. I've seen some students that use UWorld, but AMBOF as like a reference if they need more information. It could be an expensive solution, but it certainly works. Uh, and I think to answer Joel's question about optimizing your QBank, hands down the most common problem I see is students doing too many questions a day. You have to remember that doing questions is only one hour, 40 questions, one hour, and then you have all these questions that you have to read through and understand and review. And in my experience, you know, it takes one hour to do the questions. And I think my fastest students kind of review them in roughly maybe two hours. And some on the slower end, which was me, it usually takes me like three hours to review. So you're looking at four hours to do 40 questions plus the review. So you really kind of cap around 80 questions a day. And I think that that's a really common pitfall is trying to crank through too much a day without actually solidifying the learning. In terms of self-assessments, um, UWorld self-assessments are really good. I think the benefit there is it's four blocks, 40 questions each, excellent practice questions, similar to the real exam. A little bit of a caution, sometimes um, the scores, you know, actually, as a, as a matter of fact, I think all the three-digit scores that get generated from these practice tests, you have to take with a grain of salt because we really don't know how they're validated. You don't know if someone out there is sitting there with their book open working through that self-assessment. You don't know if someone's doing it with a friend. And so what I tell students is just look at your raw score. If you're hitting a certain percentage of questions correct, I can guarantee you, you will either pass or score in a certain range on the real test. And so you'll see the UWorld three-digit scores, the NBME three-digit scores are all kind of all over the place. I've had people do phenomenal on the exam that get a not phenomenal score on an MBME practice test. And so I think that's a really big challenge. Students always want to map that three-digit score um, onto their performance, but you have to be a little bit careful. Um, but all of these are great exams. UWorld exams are great. MBME exams are great. And the free 120, I think for me is a must. I make sure all my students do this. These are old exam questions. They're available on the USMLE website. And actually you can take the free 120, which is just a three block practice test in the testing center. And so it's a really nice option for people that have testing anxiety or a fear of sort of the real day. And it helps them ease their stress and get a test run before doing the real thing. And then um, in terms of just things to consider when you're picking question banks and doing self-assessments is the standard error on the exam is huge, everyone. You know, it, how many times has someone come to me and said, I was scoring two four, 250s on my practice test and I got a 235 on test day. And you know, my response is usually it kind of makes sense. <laughs> if you pull up your score report and scroll down and you read the fine print, it says, if you were to take this exam X number of times, you would score anywhere between 235 and 265. It's a really big standard error, sometimes up to 14 points. And so um, it, it's not uncommon for that to happen. And so you just got to remember that you're going to be in a spectrum of scores. And sometimes you fall above that and sometimes you fall below that. And then in terms of the three digit scores, I've already addressed this. They can be really hard to interpret. We don't know how these exams are validated. We don't know how they're graded, how the curve is set. And so I always tell students, look at the raw score and with guidance, you can tell exactly how you're going to perform. If you're scoring, if you're scoring 50% on these exams, you're missing half of the questions. You're getting 20 out of every 40 questions right, which means you got a lot of work to do. But if you're scoring in the 75, 80%, you're getting roughly 30 out of 40, 32 out of 40 questions right. And that's really good. And then um, take the exams how you take the real test. Lots of students um, take them on the couch or in the coffee shop. And I never understood that, you know, take it like the real deal. When you're practicing sports, you practice on the field the way you're gonna play the real day. And so I really recommend students do that. Don't drink coffee during the exam. Don't eat snacks. Don't lean back in your chair. It's like, it's like a test run. So those are just some pearls that I wanted to leave with you guys. Yeah, certainly some pearls. Um, I completely agree with this test of reviewing. I, I tell students, no less than two hours and try not to be more than three hours. Like two to three hours is like a great amount of time that it should, like if you're, if you're spending an hour to review an hour test, 
you're really not getting as much out of it as you can. And so, and then obviously more than three hours just gets hard to, or as far as efficiency, but that, that's, a, that's certainly a pearl there. And same with the, um, the taking it as you would like the actual test is super valuable. AMBOSS is newer, you know, it's, it, wasn't, it hasn't been around for too long, but it's been a pretty robust question bank. And I think the nice thing about both AMBOSS and your world is like, there's so much in the the, the, you know, the answers that it's like a second textbook. And it's nice that AMBOSS kind of organizes that too in a, in a, in a kind of usable fashion. So super helpful. Some common pitfalls in preparing for step 2 CK. There's a lot of pitfalls. Zach's gonna tell us about them and how you can avoid them. Yeah, I'll rip through these so we can save some good time for the Q&A. Uh, we'll start from number one. So we talked about this already, difficult to see in the big picture. You know, make sure your plan makes sense. Make sure that you're aware of debt uh, deadlines coming up. Make sure you're aware of traveling, weddings, et cetera. Make sure you make a nice study schedule before getting started. I see a lot of students just start studying without direction. Utilizing too many resources we touched on as well. I think QBank plus one is a great model. Uh, try to pick a QBank, try to pick a video or book resource that you like and stick to it. Uh, comparing yourself to others and friends, this is a huge pitfall for a lot of students. So my friend got a 275, my friend got a 260. And I did the same thing as them. I wanna to try to do the same. And it really leads to a lot of stress. You really just gotta focus on your own. Look at those objective scores and um, really, really try to minimize the amount of time you spend asking other people their goals. Someone might be going into a really competitive specialty and you may, you may not need the same scores to do what you hope to do. Um, lack of systematic approach to questions. This is a really common issue I see in my tutoring. Make sure that you figure out how to approach questions. Um, there is a systematic way to do it. Uh, and I think it saves a lot of time and it really, I've seen phenomenal increases in scores just from approaching questions in a more systematic manner, reading the stem first, looking at the answers, utilizing an image when it's available. Those are, those are really valuable tips that can help you. So if you don't have an approach to your questions, you should think about asking someone or having one of us maybe even help you out in the future doing that. Um, not trusting your gut. This is a really common issue. Students love this one. I'm 50-50 all the time and I can never get the question right. And it's really funny because when they're 50-50 and they pick one, it's usually the right answer and then they end up switching it and switching it back and switching it and switching it back if you're truly 50 50 and you have no idea i promise there is some kind of mechanism that just you usually pick the, the right answer the first time and when you start to overthink bad things happen um, and question banks are helpful here too right because there's the, there's the there's the data point that tells you how often are you switching yeah. from wrong answers to right answers and so you can look at that. If you're someone who does that a lot, then just don't change your answer too. Exactly. Uh, tutor mode, this is like my worst enemy. People love tutor mode. It's chill, it's nice. You can do questions at work, but the reality of tutor mode is the real test is not in tutor mode. And I always tell, they're always like, well, I'm still learning. I get the blocks done faster. My response to that is, you know, if you get a question on pneumonia and, you know, whether it's hospital or community acquired, and then you pick the right answer, and then it tells you all about the mechanism of vancomycin and pseudomonal coverage. And then you get a question later about that. You just read all about it. So it's really easy to get that next question right. Where on the real test, you never get live feedback on what you got right or wrong. So you have to live with your answers. And that can be stressful. You know, how many times have I got a three-part question on the exam, missed the first part, and then I just have to like live with it you know you just have to keep going and sometimes you know and sometimes you don't and so i really am not a fan of tutor mode but as i said before exceptions to every rule i've had some people that have had success with it but very rare cases um not preparing for test day conditions make sure you're ready make sure you know what it's like in there step one can help a lot if you've already taken this make sure you schedule breaks and days off we alluded to this earlier it's really important to de-stress a day of no studying is a day to exercise get groceries do your life stuff you can't be successful studying if you don't take a day for yourself to rest. Sleep's really important too. Um, forgetting to brush up on the easy facts, lots of points here. Um, sometimes when you calculate the scores, it gets a little scary to know three or four questions a block makes a huge difference. And so make sure you brush up on vaccines, screening factor, screening and risk factors is really important. We talked about number 10. Really, it's more important to review the blocks than to do the blocks. Um, it's painful, it takes a long time, but it's very important. Um, 
Number 11 is kind of a, a joke of mine that I tell students is like fake studying. I have a lot of students that want to watch videos for four hours. It feels great. You feel like you're being super productive, but it's really hard for that knowledge to be solidified. And so usually the thing that is the worst to do, like reading, is the thing that's best for you. And so if studying starts to feel a little bit too fun or like you're kind of like you're not really absorbing everything, I think that you just got to ask yourself, like, are you really studying or maybe you're cranking through that Anki deck while you're watching TV or cooking dinner, I think it gets a little bit hard um, to really solidify that data. We talked about number 12 and then number 13 is what I'm really passionate about. If you need help or you need some, you didn't do well in step one, honestly, even six months before your exam is not too early to start thinking about how you're gonna prepare and tackle that next exam. Lots of students come to me with two weeks to study and I'm like, oh man, this is going to be really challenging. And it usually takes a week or two of studying to diagnose truly what's wrong and to iterate. So if you need help, get it early. So many pearls here. I'm just going to leave this up for a second. People can screenshot it and take it away with them. I, I you see this so many times. It's, it's certainly a lot, of, a lot of pearls here for sure. I think with the fake studying, you know, reading, people measure their, uh, their studying by a number of pages they've read. So they, you know, quickly read through 10 to 15 pages. It's the same story. So um, very, very helpful stuff here. Now, I want to make sure we leave time for the Q&A. So we are going to very quickly run through our favorite resources. These are the things that we have used for Step 2 CK. We recommend to our students and we um, have seen great success with. So we'll start with Rada. What are your favorite resources? Yeah, so I alluded to some of these things earlier. Um, my personal favorite um, in terms of a question bank that I used was UWorld. Um, and I'll answer one of the questions that was asked. Um, I reset my UWorld question bank after my clerkship year um, because I knew that a lot of the questions um, I hadn't seen for uh, almost an entire year and I had probably forgotten a lot of topics from say my first clerkship. Um, so I reset my QBank. Um, I, I was also um, the type of person who used Amboss for the knowledge library that it had. So let's say that um, you know there was a specific topic or pathology that came up um, I really like to look it up and learn more about it and just make sure that I knew, you know, how to diagnose that specific pathology and how I would treat that pathology, um, just in case that's a specific UWorld question didn't answer that, um, in the, in, in the, uh, answer explanation. Um, you can also use, uh, the Amboss question bank. We can like go on for hours about which one is better. Um, it's kind of really up to, uh, your own personal preference. Um, and what has worked for you in the past. Um, but something that I really recommend, um, especially as the test kind of moves toward um, emphasizing principles of like communication, quality, safety, things like that, is read those specific sections um, in the AMBOSS knowledge library um, and do the practice questions. Um, there were a lot of similar questions to those specific questions that I, that I outlined um, in the slide. Um, on those specific topics, and I would really recommend doing that. Um, I was kind of surprised how similar um, AMBOSS wording was to my actual exam. Um, and I did, I did those specific sections like a couple of days before my exam. Um, I also like Boards and Beyond um, as a video series for step two. I definitely did not watch all hundred, I don't even know how many um, hours of uh, uh, Boards and Beyond there are, but I used it if there was um, kind of a specific area that I had completely forgotten about. I felt like it was more um, detailed than what online med ed uh, tends to be. Um, since online med ed, I used it more specifically for, you know, right before I had a rotation, I wanted to brush off on, on certain things about the rotation. And then finally, Anki. Um, Anki is very uh, specific to how you use it. So I didn't, I, de I definitely was not doing like thousands of Anki cards a day, but I had specific topics that were sort of memorization heavy that I used it for. Um, and I kind of, I didn't use it in the traditional way that um, it's typically um, proposed to be used. I, I definitely wasn't using it for, you know, like two, three years and then, you know, kind of uh, referring back to it, but I used it for kind of pediatric milestones, things that I kind of needed to commit to memory, like right before the exam, it helped to kind of uh, repeat those things over and over. I used it for things like that. If you, uh, if you're a chronic Anki user, stick to that. Don't, don't cut yourself off from that. Yeah, definitely Anki, very polarizing, but I agree. If you haven't started Anki by the time you're doing step two, maybe not a good time to start it. And if you are using it, little details only. Awesome. What do you think, Zach? 
Uh, I'm a huge believer in your world. Um, tons and tons of people successful with AMBOT. So you just got to feel out which one's better for you. Uh, I liked online med ed for the framework. What I mean by this is anytime I hit a topic where I didn't really have an approach, I think online med ed does a really fantastic job at giving you the framework and then you world can fill in the details. Step up to medicine and master the boards. Um, I use this more as a reference text. You're reading a U world question and you're kind of curious a little bit more about a disease or work up for that uh, disease. I would refer to a, a book. So I kind of would have my book open in front of me, but I didn't commit to reading through it front to back. I just would reference it as, as needed. And then huge uh, Cram Fighter fan. I don't get paid by Cram Fighter. I really believe in it. I think it's an awesome tool to help make a study schedule. It was huge for me using Cram Fighter. It's a beautiful tool that helps make a study schedule. However, if you don't use it the way it's meant to be used, it's really common for students to use it for a week and drop off. So if it's not for you, go ahead and do um, a, a Word doc or a Google Sheet. But the key to a schedule, by the way, is that you can't be editing your schedule more than you're studying. So if you find that you're doing that, it's a huge problem. I mean, really, people get obsessed down to the hour. Don't do that. Um, and then I, I, there's literature out there that shows we as humans actually learn from all of the modalities pretty well. And so whether you're a visual learner or a reader, yeah, you might have a preference, but all of them are necessary. So read the answers to your questions watch videos, do flashcards, whatever works for you. But I, I generally do prefer reading as a study modality. Um, and then pairing that with videos and having that visual effect can be really powerful. Nice. Mine, I keep mine pretty simple. Um, a question bank, definitely you world is my, is a definite, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Everyone has to do you world. I think Amboss is a great second. Um, I think it's good if you want additional questions or if you want, you know, even if even, even if you don't finish it, but you want some more questions. Online meted, I find is being useful for giving big picture um, overviews of topics. I personally do like videos, although I have, you know, I can find myself and I have some students I've worked with find themselves and just blindly watch them. But I think online meted is good for overview and also nice to, to kind of mix up the work. You know, step two CK secrets is a a little bit of a secret. It's a small book and it is not comprehensive, but I have found that students in, you know, certain students like to review it right before their exam, kind of hits the bullet points. It's almost like a confidence booster. It's not super long um, and it sometimes can catch small details that people might've forgotten. And then Anki again, very polar plus or minus. If you used Anki successfully historically, do it again. If you haven't, I wouldn't start now. And then if you do do it, Make your own cards and make them small details. Um, a little bit about how a med school can, coach can help you. So we provide one-on-one -on -one personalized tutoring services. So the way it works is you get paired with a tutor, an awesome tutor like Zach or Rodas, someone who has an exceptional track record of um, education and teaching, and also did very, very well in medical school and on their exams. And they can help you with all aspects of your prep from the actual test taking aspects of the exam to reviewing practice questions, reviewing high yield and challenging concepts and content and creating a study schedule. So critically important for kind of addressing all aspects of success from exam. We work with students six months to a year before their exam. And in fact, for the step two CK, one of the ways that works the best is to get tutoring a year ahead, get tutoring throughout the year for each of your shelf exams. So throughout the year, you're actually preparing for step two CK. You're performing higher on your shelf exams. And when the actual exam comes around at the end, people are much more pre prepared. So if you know, if you're one of those people who knows they need to score high on step two, or you're someone who, who um, thinks he has really ambitious goals, score goals, really something to consider. Um, we really focus on a personalized approach, so we don't use cooker, cookie cutter or anything. You know, as you've realized, a lot of these answers are nuanced and based on the students. So we really try to get to know our students, build a relationship with them, and try to find out how to help them perform at the best that they can. Um, I, I literally already talked about that a little bit. We have several guarantees. The long and short of it is that we really stand behind our tutoring services and you can go online you could read more about all of those different aspects but i really want to move on to the question and answer to make sure we get to some of these questions there is one question that i think zach is going to be a good person to answer because he's kind of alluded to this kind of in a few of his slides any advice to improve endurance during the test any thoughts on that zach this is a nine yeah. hour test how are we going to survive it 
take your blocks timed at home. Don't do them on tutor mode. Um, try to simulate, like emulate the real test as much as you can. I think taking practice tests for someone that has endurance problems is really important. I don't usually recommend like weekly practice tests. I think two weeks is kind of a nice time, but there have been ex uh, circumstances where students have taken practice tests maybe a little bit more often to get that endurance up. But I always tell students too, if you're gonna do two blocks in a day and you have an endurance problem, maybe it makes sense for you to do the block, take a five minute break and then do the next block and then spend the rest of the day reviewing. And then uh, also it's something that can help endurance is getting more efficient with your uh, question strategy. If you sometimes I've seen students that have endurance problems that read everything from top to bottom and I'd get tired too. And so you have to leverage images, EKGs, you know, the way the question is formatted and you might be able to answer questions a little bit more quickly and feel a little bit less uh, tired during the block. And then also like lunch and is really important. Like you gotta like hydrate and eat during the exam. And so taking snacks and things while you're practicing that give you more energy or help you build your endurance is really important. I think people forget about those things. Yeah, two, two things that I've, that I've recommended to students that I think have helped. It can be helpful to do exam simulations. So like do nine blocks in a day is something that, you know, can be helpful, especially if you're like scared of doing a nine hour test, which is normal, but um, you could test the waters being like, how am I gonna feel on hour eight or nine? That could be something you would consider doing. And then you review them over the next um, day or two. And then also consider, if you're someone who knows you have an endurance problem, consider doing your blocks of questions at the end of the day and then reviewing them the next day. So you kind of maybe review in the morning when you feel super fresh, but you're doing the question, you're doing the actual questions at night when maybe you're tired and you, you can do, it can kind of simulate how, you know, maybe hour seven or hour eight of the exam would be. So give those two kind of things a try and, and, and that might be helpful. And uh, Verdal, you kind of alluded to this one earlier, but what do you think about when you're resetting UWorld? Should I, should I do UWorld twice? Should I reset the questions? What do you, how do you advise your students with this? Yeah, so um, I think I alluded to it before, but I think uh, it just makes the most sense to reset the, the QBank, especially if you have completed most of it. Um, if you only have 25% left, you're probably gonna finish within a couple of weeks and then you know what are you gonna do with the rest of your time? Um, and another thing is that if you are completing the Q bank uh, right after the end of your clerkship year, um, you won't have seen a lot, of, uh, a lot of topics that you kind of covered in your earlier clerkship. So for example, um, one of my first clerkships was pediatrics and I knew that when I was studying for the exam, um, almost like a year and a half later, I remembered very little of pediatrics. Um, so I definitely needed to reset it and see all of those questions over. So I, I think it just makes the most sense to reset the QBank. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you just completed the question bank, maybe not, doesn't make sense to, to, to um, reset it. Maybe it makes sense to try something like AMBOSS, but I think if you've done them throughout the year, I think then it makes sense. Do you ever recommend, this is another question that has come up, um, if someone's really struggling with step one, do you ever recommend them to take step two CK first or out of order? I can, I can start, in my experience, I have not recommended this to anybody. I think it does make sense to start with step one and then move to step two CK. Even if you're experiencing challenges with step one, I don't think that there's a lot to be gained by doing step two first, but that, has been my um, experience historically with students, but what do you guys think? Yeah, I generally agree with agree with that. Step one has a lot of foundational knowledge that helps for step two. It could also be dependent on your school and the circumstances you're in, but I don't see any immediate utility in trying to shift gears and doing that. Yeah. Um, another question, and this actually may be a good question for Radha, because I actually don't have as much experience with this resource, but between online med and boards and beyond, what do you, what is your recommendation and how do they differ? I'm not super familiar with boards and beyond for step two, a little more familiar with it for step one, um, but fairly familiar with online med ed for step two. How do you, how did you go about, think, you know, you use this resource and you've kind of talked about it a little bit, how do you think about them similar or different? Yeah, so in the context of studying for step two, um, I personally found that Boards and Beyond was good as a reference tool. So I certainly didn't watch the entire thing from beginning to end. 
Um, that would take hundreds of hours that I know I didn't have during step two dedicated period. Um, so it was great to sort of take a deep dive into a topic that I felt like I forgot everything about. Um, online med ed, I think is much more doable if you uh, kind of want to complete a resource from beginning to end during your dedicated period. Um, it's also very useful uh, clinically, like, you know, before you start a clerkship or before you start a specific elective, um, it's great to kind of watch all of the online med ed videos and that specific topic um, to get a really good overview. Um, in terms of like the pros and cons of both of them, um, I would say that Words and Beyond tends to be very long and very detailed. Um, and so if you're kind of crunched for time, it can kind of be a more difficult uh, resource to use, whereas um, online med ed kind of focuses on the bigger picture and sort of creating a broad differential diagnosis um, for a given topic. Um, and you can kind of supplement with going into a deep dive on specific details later on. So he sort of focuses on um, the bigger picture details. Um, if you're kind of thinking about, you know, what the resources differ based on what you're sort of trying to get out of them. Great. Well, um, we went over so much today that we're actually over time. So I just want to shout out to Zach and Rodal. Thank you for joining us. We are going to put a poll up on your screen if you are, want to learn a bit more about what we do here at Med School Coach. So, you know, feel free to fill that fill that poll out if you want to get any more information. Otherwise, um, thank you for joining us this evening, guys. And it's um it's been really fun. And hopefully, this was useful for you. And now you're ready to get out there and get a high step two CK score. <laughs>